Hello, welcome to Meat Factory. My name is Eva Rybova. I'm a curator of the Meat Factory galleries, and I would like to welcome you here. Even though our space is currently empty, as you can see, uh, we are still working on our program. Uh, all of our four different departments, such as music, uh, galleries, theater, and art residencies, are working on their programs. We are trying to make alternative online uh, content for you. So I would like to suggest and uh, invite you to watch our website and our social media. And yeah, we will be waiting for you to meet us again here at the Meat Factory. And uh, you are now watching the guided tour of our current exhibition, Where Are the Lions? Ubi Sunt Leones, which was opened on the 22nd of September and it was closed only after three weeks. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit more about it. So let's go to see it. In years past, unknown places on maps were marked with the word Hicks und Leones. In English, lions are here. Today, thanks to applications such as Google Earth, all of us have access to detailed views of up to 98% of the Earth's surface, with the exception of some places that have been deleted based on threats to personal privacy or national security. Some data from the surface of the Moon and Mars are already available, as well as tools for monitoring the night sky. And the lines are forming to climb the Mount Everest. As its name suggests, the exhibition is a reference to the fact that currently it is possible, possibly easier to climb the highest mountain in the world than to find an undiscovered spot on our planet. The exhibition itself does not enter unexplored territory. Discovery and climbing literature and exhibitions have been created and uh, they could fill several shelves uh, of the National Library. But despite the change in the form, the theme of discovery and adventure is still alive, even at a time when everything has already apparently been discovered. This project was somehow ironically developed at the time when most people were forced into isolation and home during the coronavirus pandemic. This very recent and uh, contemporary global experience highlights a subliminal theme, a kind of undercurrent of the exhibition. The dilemma of today's adventurers who want to satisfy their romantic desire for the experience of discovering new places while maintaining a responsible approach to the environment. And the question which could be like a motto of this exhibition is how did we get to the point where we are standing in a line to climb the highest mountain uh, of our world. And uh, the path, uh, how we got there, starts in the Romantic era. This is also why uh, our exhibition starts with a work by a contemporary artist, Philip Dvořák, who directly works with, romantic, uh, with references to the Romanticism. Let's go see it. We are looking at a video from Philip Dvořák. The video is called A Painter Confronting the Elements on a Mountain Top at Sunrise on the last day before the end of the world. Yes, this is the whole title. The exhibition, uh, the, the work has been created in 2012 has been already uh, exhibited several times. You can see that the painter wages a losing battle attempting to capture a footprint of the world before its inevitable demise. This recording of Philip Bojak's performance as the introductory work to the exhibition represents a direct reference to Romanticism, specifically the iconic painting The Pilgrim Over the Sea of Mist by Kaspar David Friedrich. 
Friedrich Spilgrim, like Dvořák's painter, stands on a mountain looking down in Dvořák's case at the, snow, at the snowstorm. Yet a century before that, at the beginning of the Enlightenment era, mountains were usually depicted from below and often in exaggeratedly monstrous, frightening shapes. With the Enlightenment began, Romanticism developed further, the human desire to confront nature, worship it, and at the same time to seize it or to colonize it by subjecting it to research. There is another work by Philip Dvořák at the exhibition space. We can go to the second room. So this is a painting, one of the newest paintings from this year, uh, from Philip Dvořák, a young artist. Uh, this painting is called, quite specifically, Mountains and Clouds. And you can see that there are these exact references to the Romantic era, also with uh, the way it worshipped the, uh, the Gothic shapes, but that are somehow disappearing, they are more abstract. Uh, Philip says that he is trying to imagine the way people in the 19th century imagined uh, the Gothic era and the mysticism that it provided. So this is imagination of an imagination. And of course, it is a quite monochromous painting, but there is this colorful stripe, which is a reference to a sunset. As you can see, it's a very romantic piece of art itself. As we, are, as we were entering through, let's say, the first chapter of the exhibition, which was a reference to a romantic era, we are entering a second, in the, in the exhibition space, we can see a second chapter, which is represented by the theme of the mountains. So from the first chapter of romantic era, we are slowly moving to the second one, which uh, is the mountains. Mountaineering's origin can be dated, dated back uh, to the 16th century. However, these first expeditions to the mountains were motivated exclusively by agricultural and economic interests. Rough and untamed nature did not evoke an aesthetically pleasing experience. Even according to some texts of the time, mountain landscapes were referred to as ulcers, bumps, growth, even nature's disgrace. Travelers became, began to visit mountain environments only in the second half of the 18th century, motivated by enthusiasm and the search for beauty. Kant described mountain massives as symbols of nobility. By the end of the 19th century, all, the, uh, all of the alpine peaks have been vanquished and climbers had moved to the Himalayas. The growing interest in this new type of sport meant that climbing techniques and equipment were improving, which progressively allowed for increasing numbers of people to make, they make their way up to the top. And here we are talking again about the line to the Mount Everest, in between the lines. Uh, as we can see at the work of Stefan Papčo, a Slovak artist who is representing here uh, the chapter of the mountains at the exi exhibition. Um, in addition to the search for beauty, grandeur and a sense of success, mountaineering may also be a way to overcome political lack of freedom. Uh, as this beautiful wooden uh, sculpture shows, by the way, her name is Zuzana, uh, we like to call her here at the gallery familiarly Zuzanka. Um, you, you are actually looking at um, uh, at the sculpture in the human size uh, of uh, of a woman who is bivouacking, who is trying to sleep uh, in freezing environment. Zuzamna is part, the sculpture is part of the group of sculptures, which is honoring uh, the group of Czechoslovak 
climbers that were active or mostly active in uh, during the socialist time um, in the 70s and 80s uh, in Czechoslovakia. And these five people that are represented in the sculpture group by Stefan Papčo uh, were considered or are still considered as somehow ideological leaders of the climbing community. These people were not only climbing uh, to uh, satisfy their needs to do some kind of physical activity, but they were also, it allowed them to literally go beyond the fronters, which uh, during communist time was not possible mm, because of their um, great sport activities, they were able to be part of international uh, competitions and really going into the Alps, which for regular people was not possible at the time. So it was for them a search for a certain civil freedom. As you can see, the sculptural group or the sculpture is not just a sculpture. It also is a piece that was part of a performance. Stefan Papčo, who himself is a great, um, great mountain climber, he was actually uh, on his own back taking these extremely heavy wooden sculptures to the mountains, to the Alps, to places where the people that these sculptures are depicting have in the past climbing themselves. And they, these sculptures have been placed uh, to the mountains, to the places where, uh, as a contemporary climber, you could uh, easily see them. So just imagine that you are climbing the mountain and that you see one of the hidden wooden sculptures like this. It must be quite scary. Stefan Babcho left these, uh, these sculptures in the wilderness for a couple months, maybe years, and then took them back again. And he loved the nature to uh, do its own job to the wooden structure. We have a second piece from Stefan Papčo here at the exhibition. Uh, this piece is called Bonekan. It's from his Absolute series. It's a bronze sculpture. Uh, which is uh, representing basically a part of a, a climbing gear of the mountain climbers uh, from the last century, from the 70s or 80s. Bonekan is uh, something that I like to call uh, a moira of that time. It's a material that most of the climbing gear was made from. Today, we are not really familiar with this word or the material, uh, material anymore. Let's make a little jump and let's move to see a second um, artist and uh, her artworks that are here to describe uh, the mountain chapter, let's say, of the exhibition. We are currently looking at one of the two pieces by Natasha Kokic that we have at the exhibition. Uh, both pieces are drawings, uh, pencil drawings on paper, um, and they have been made directly and commissioned for uh, the show Where Are the Lions? As you can see, the um, drawings is slowly moving from very realistic depiction of the mountain tops to more abstract shapes. It's being somehow blurred to some kind of fog at the end of the drawing. Natasha Kokic um, is one of the artists who doesn't even need to go to the mountains, because as she says with her own words, she has them in her head. Natasha is uh, drawing and making uh, paintings and drawings in a way 
uh, of landscapes, of different kinds of lands uh, landscapes as uh, if it were portraits of people that she knows and that she's close to or uh, if it were a self-portrait. She's moving from realistic depiction towards more abstract shapes. As I said, she's bl blurring the image. Uh, the reason why she does that is that uh, she tries to do a metaphor of the way we are shaping our own lives and our own realities. With these drawings, she makes a subjective images of one's life. While I was preparing the exhibition, Where Are the Lions, I posed, uh, or I was giving myself very often the question of, uh, yeah, what is at the core of this kind of inner urge that drives people towards these extreme actions, such as climbing El Capitan, El Capitan's 900 meter wall without any kind of protection? Is it a fear of volatile superficiality, the horror vacui, fear of the end of the world, or paradoxically the fear of death? Are we afraid that we will not live our short lives to the fullest, that we will not exhaust our potential, that we will be just passive consumers of our destiny? Isn't the hunt for adventure just the activity of people who are empty inside and who cannot be in the same room with themselves? In one of his books, His Holiness the Dalai Lama recommends the following strategy as an aid against weakness, that is, insufficient concentration on one's object of meditation. First, try to intensify your perception of the object. If that doesn't help, brighten or elevate the object, or pay more attention to its details. If that doesn't help, leave the object and think temporarily about joyful things. If that doesn't help, leave the meditation and go on to an elevated place or somewhere with a great view. Climbing a mountain, endurance running, or any other demanding and stamina-based physical exertion are all functional means of achieving calm concentration or new knowledge or for those who are unable to meditate. Um, the paintings that, are, uh, that you are looking at right now are from the series Atmospheric Pollution by a uh, Chilean artist, Macarena Ruiz Tegel. Um, Macarena is an artist based both in Santiago de Chile and Berlin. Originally, this series of paintings had eight pieces of canvas and we just had space to place four of them in here. They have been all created uh, while she was at the artist residency in Hong Kong. Her paintings at this exhibition, to me personally, represent um, a kind of a break and a, a kind of an, al of an altered knowledge or a different kind of state of mind that you can get while you are climbing to a high mountain or doing some kind of extreme physical activity. But Macarena uh, had a different approach when she was creating these paintings. She calls them atmospheric pollution and her biggest Im inspiration was extremely polluted air uh, in Hong Kong, which as she demonstrated by several video footages, uh, is able to go from a almost clear sky to uh, a fog where you cannot see your own feet within short 20 minutes. From this atmospheric uh, break, uh, we can move to another piece of art, which uh, is called a Karman line. It's a piece from Felix. Felix Kiesling, and I'm going to speak about him a little bit more further. Uh, but Felix is this type of a sculptor who is already playing with the earth F as if it were a sculpting material. Uh, 
this is a column that looks like a simple um, metal wire, wire ready-made thing, which actually it is like that. And uh, at this point of the guided tour, I would like to thank uh, Drátovny, uh, Czech Republic, well, the metal wire company, which was um, so kind that they lended us this wire. And after the end of this show, we are going to give it back to them and it will be available for sale again as a normal wire. But while at this exhibition, we, uh, it's a piece of art called Karman Line. And um, for those who are not familiar with this term, Karman Line is uh, the frontier or the border between atmosphere and, um, and space, that kind of blue line uh, which, which marks the blue space of the Earth atmosphere and the black space of the universe or of the space. Uh, this line is exactly 100 kilometers. Uh, the distance is 100 kilometers from uh, the surface of the Earth, and that is why we have exactly 100 kilometers long wire. This is not the only piece that we have from Felix Kiesling, and we can go back to the first room because now that there are no visitors, we have uh, the possibility to actually go through the exhibition space as I originally intended it, and that the exhibition space really didn't allow me to do it. And this is, by the way, the reason why. As you can see, here is a very simple thing, such as a pole, which is placed in the floor. But of course, it's not just a simple pole. And I can tell you, and that's really a fact, that the second part of this uh, pole is now currently in uh, Uruguay, in Montevideo, at the Center of Contemporary Art. And our gallery, Meat Factory, is now for a couple of weeks uh, symbolically connected with its partner, partner gallery in Montevideo. We got very exact coordinates uh, from Felix Kiesling and his mathematician assistant. He gave us the co coordinates, the place and the angle of how to place the pole in order to have a perfect line uh, that connects us with the other part of the world, which, as I said again, was in Montevideo. On the accompanying pieces, uh, here two digital prints, you can see that uh, there are other examples of the project of this earth piercing, which has a very complicated German title I'm not able to pronounce. Felix really, uh, as I already said, he works with the earth as if it was, if it were um, a sculpting material. He travels from one part of the world to the other and uh, he plays with it symbolically. And thus he's showing us how accessible the earth is to him. Unlike Philippe Dvořák, who at the beginning of the exhibition was standing in front of nature and he was battling it and he was not winning, Felix now is showing us how he can win already. And it's a bit ironic, it's a bit frightening, uh, kind of probably disrespectful, but honestly said, no, it's, it's not like Felix is not respectful to uh, our planet. But he shows us that, yeah, everything is now possible. Uh, when I was telling uh, another artist who is represented at this show, uh, Jiří Franta, when I was telling him uh, about Felix and his practice, and I was describing to him another of Felix's project, which was that he uh, cut off 40 centimeters, or he made uh, continental Europe 40 centimeters shorter than it was, uh, or than it usually was, uh, because he went to Norway and then to Portugal, and he cut off 20 centimeters of um, of the land, which was the most northern part of continental Europe and then most southern part of the continental Europe. And then uh, he exhibited these pieces of earth 
in a gallery with um, a caption that said, quite ironically, your maps are not correct anymore. And I was telling about this project to Jiří Franta, and he said, yes, but our group, Rafa Nivi, did something quite similar a couple of years ago. And that's what you are looking at right now. This light box by group, Rafa Nivi, shows a picture of how they moved the borders of the Czech Republic, the borders with Poland, by 10 meters, and thus making our republic 10 meters longer without, you know, any war. And we can go back, uh, or not back, but further. Um, if you are looking for a place on the earth which has not yet been discovered, the ocean is the right place to go. If we wanted to make an exhibition with a chapter with ocean, well, one chapter is not enough because there could be the whole exhibition space just about this theme. Maybe that's something that will come in the future. Ocean is a space which, with, even with number of satellites, cannot be really mapped. Its surface changes all the time as the sea is breathing. And here I'm using a metaphor from a book uh, from David Bem, he, who is another of the exhibited artists, and we will talk about him in a while. But now we are looking at one of the artists who is representing here the chapter of the oceans. Uh, Alexander Ponomarev is an artist who systematically works with the seas and oceans. A former sailor, naval engineer, and multimedia artist. He has been creating works of art since the 1990s, which uh, combine all of these skills. Whether building a ship in Moroccan desert, a submarine passing through the canals of Venice, drawings on navigation maps, which we would have exhibited if not for the coronavirus crisis or presenting a naval event, a Maya performance that you are looking at right now. In recent years, Ponomarev has advocated as widely as possible the idea of expeditionary art, with the subtext of idealistic, apolitical, supranational shared space. The organizer of the first Antarctic Biennial in 2017 he sailed with 100 member crew of artists, writers, philosophers, architects, and technicians around in the Antarctic mainland. The artistic program consisted of performances, short term installations, which after documentations were uninstalled and taken back on board, lectures and discussions on the ship. Participants in the biennial were invited to reflect on the universal cultural future of Antarctica as a model of shared space similar to the oceans and the cosmos. You are currently looking at one of the two artworks that uh, we are presenting at the exhibition. In the Barents Sea, Ponomarev collaborated with sailors of the Northern Fleet to organize an expedition of four ships using special naval equipment to temporarily erase Sedlovaty Island from the face of the Earth after first taking it off the nautical map. Uh, not long after this naval performance, the K141 Kursk submarine was tragi tragically sunk in the waters of the Barents Sea on August 12, 2000, killing 118 crew mer members. According to Pom Ponomarev, his actions or his action was condemned by some viewers as a harbinger or even a cause of this misfortune. Since this performance, a number of events here happened in the world, which we have potentially influenced the the which have potentially influenced the interpretation of his work, speci uh, specifically within the context of tense geopolitical geopolitical relations between Russia and the West. The author him himself speaks of his work as pure land art, or more precisely, ocean art. 
with this said, we can move to another uh, video that we have uh, here at the exhibition, which is called the Buffin figure. In ancient times, various carved figures attached to the bow of the ship served as its guardian angels. Sailors have always re revered these peculiar amulets, believing that they bring good luck. The artists revived the historical tradition playing the role of the figurehead on a modern, of a modern scientific liner crossing the Baffin Sea. He timed himself to the prow of a research vessel and turned into a living sculpture which, hoisted on the stem, flies over the cold waves of the sea. Ponomarev's revival of this practice brings us back to the mystery, superstition, perils and dangers of the open ocean and sailors' desire to war off evil omens and unknown creatures. At the same year as the Antarctic Biennial that I talked about was happening, uh, the artistic duo Jiří Franta and David Bem also visited Antarctica and they created their piece that we are going to see right now. It's a 16 second piece and I believe that we can afford to see it in the full length. As you see that uh, Jiří Franta is throwing a stone with carved words, see you in the future, to one piece of the iceberg. Behind this video on the wall, there is a collage painting, which was created from the sketches that Jiří Franta and David Bem both made during their trip, exactly on their boat. If you look at it closely, you can see a little pieces and that somehow reconstruct the memory of the trip and of the expedition. And with this work, we are going to the last piece of the exhibition where are the lions to the last chapter of it that I called Microadventurism. The hashtag Microadventures um, was globally spread via social networks by the British adventurer Alastair Humphreys, who in 2011 exchanged long journeys for smaller expeditions near his residence. He summed up his urban experiences, such as trip around the M25 motorway bypass, in the book of Microadventures, Local Discoveries for Great Expace, Escapes, which quickly became a bestseller. To me, Czech artist Vladimir Turner is a great example of a person who lives as a um, microadventurist if you can say it like that. In his new film called Modern Times, which has been created specifically per, for this show, uh, he presents us, us something like, that I like to call a hoverboard etudes. The film Modern Times is based on Chaplin's, or the title of the film is based on Charlie Chaplin's film from the 1936 of the same name. As Vladimir says, modern times have changed dramatically since Charlie Chaplin. Today, given his soulful reflection on the world, Chaplin would probably be dependent on Xanax. According to Turner, in humanity's effort to escape boredom and natural movement, it has achieved a ridiculous extension of human limbs via technological conveniences. The main character, Vladimir himself, strikes out onto the city streets and the wild landscape of the, of the Atlantic coast. 
He gets into paradoxical situations drawn out to absurd proportions. The performer, tourist, discovers some mountains, but in reality he's a lazy consumer, consumer who rides on a hoverboard. The strong interest in phenomenon of local experiences that can be described as mic micro-adventurism satisfies uh, the current social need for a sustainable way of life and offers an alternative to today's adventurers who desire for experiences or whose desire for experiences is redeemed by their bad conscience regarding their surroundings and the environment. And with this, I would like to invite you to watch the whole film by Vladimir Turner, because it's 25 minutes long, and we are going to share a link to this full-length video on our social media. So you can, you can check it later. And at this point, I would like to... Yeah, this is the end of the show, so I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, thank you if you stay with us uh, for the rest or for the whole <coughs> tour. You see, I barely catch my breath now. So, yeah, see you soon, I hope.